Do you know how to design steel structures? Imagine being able to design a fascinating steel building that stands test of time. Well, get ready because in today's lecture, we are taking this first step into this incredible journey. Welcome to this first lecture on concept and scheme design of steel buildings. This is part 27 of the 30 part series on steel design. I'm thrilled to be your guide as we explore basics of architectural and structural design. Whether you are civil or structural engineer or an engineering student or simply curious about steel structures, this lecture is for you. Hey friends, if you're new here, I'm Dr. Javed Qureshi, a senior lecturer in structural engineering and design at London University. On this channel, we explore technical and human skills to help us lead more productive, happy and examine life. Concept and scheme design is divided into these four lectures and tutorials. The first lecture is part 27, that is basics of architectural and structural design. Second is part 28, tools for concept and scheme design. Third is part 29, concept design worked example. Fourth is part 30, which is about scheme design worked example. Let us get started with first lecture where we will talk about architectural and structural design. Today's topic is extremely important. It is about scheme and concept design. Concept and scheme design is about ideas, is about making a building a reality. It's about deciding. It's about having your choices. The way design process works is we first have some brief from client, then we try to develop a concept out of it. So we say that here we are going to provide some columns, beams and other things. And then we perform some initial calculations to justify our solution and to justify our schemes or our concepts. And then once we see that this is going to work, then we work on detailed design. Detailed design is one of the simplest things, and this is something which is taught over the entire world. But in design office, when you go and work in industry, you simply work on concept and scheme design on a daily basis. This is something which you start with. Up to now, we have covered detailed design, which is simply saying that, okay, this is the moment, these are the forces, and simply design the elements. So detailed design is one of the simplest thing and many universities teach detailed design, but not many universities would teach explicitly concept and scheme design. But this is what you will do in your design office. And this is what you learn through experience. But at this university, I think a couple of years ago, we thought that concept and scheme design should be taught explicitly so that we make a difference to our students so that we provide them more skills and then when they go and work in industry, they are industry ready. And this has been very successful, actually. So concept and scheme design. Now, this is very important in design office. The way design process works is we start from the concept and then we develop some kind of concepts and then we make them into schemes. And then we go and work on detailed design and then we produce drawings and then it goes into design review. And if the conditions are not met, then it goes back again to the concept and scheme. Which means that concept and scheme is one of the most important design aspect in structural engineering. And I'm going to talk about it today. And when you leave today's lecture, you will be equipped with all the knowledge to, to design a building from the conceptual and scheme design perspective. The basics of architectural design. We know that design is not a standalone job. It's not something that only you will be doing. When you go and work in office, you will be dealing with lots of people. You will be dealing with architects. You will be dealing with service engineers. You will be dealing with electrical and mechanical engineers. And it is not simply a structural designer or consultant himself. So you will be dealing with a lot of other people. Over the years from now on, I think the role of the structural engineers will become more and more important and will have more and more say in terms of design of buildings. In reality, a building is a brainchild of an architect. We just provide support that this building can stand up. If you really want to show your structural design skills, then in Bridges, you will be the main decision maker in Bridges. We are a large part of our team for designing a building. So first is client who is owner and who pays for the building. And secondly, the architect who designs how the building 
looks and who designs the aesthetic side who designs i mean how the rooms are going to look what would be size of the rooms and then we have interior designers who, who are responsible for finishes and then a structural engineer who makes the building stand up responsible for the bones of the building and then we have other engineers geotechnical civil electrical mechanical and fire so you will be dealing with all these people it's not a standalone job many stakeholders are involved and the buildings are all around us it is something that we use all the time it is something that we spend our probably two thirds of life most of our time is spent in buildings we work in offices you know, we come and rest in houses these are all buildings now it depends on us how we design these buildings so that we become more and more productive more and more effective and so that these buildings work for us now what makes a building beautiful is it uh, romantic is it spiritual what is the definition of beauty in my opinion i mean it is a generic term many people will have many view of beauty what makes a beautiful or good architecture is it innovative is it different as long as i mean it satisfies the requirements of a client and it it really blends in within the environment then, then that's fine human eye cannot really understand the thing which does not fit in as a human being we all want to belong so for the buildings the same is true the building should belong to its surroundings is our design daring is it ambitious like burj khalifa and the basics of architectural design is that the form follows the function the structural form if you talk about houses we rarely construct houses composed of steel structures the form follows the function the form means are you going to have a structural frame are you going to have brick construction are you going to have reinforced concrete construction so if you are constructing a house in the uk the chances are that it would be brick house office the chances are that it would be framed building first of all and then it would be reinforced concrete or steel building and for residential buildings we rarely use steel as a material of choice the house itself is a machine for living and then these kind of buildings where it's not really ornamental if you're constructing a building and less is more less is boring as well but the beauty itself is it lies in the eyes of beholder so there are three elements of architecture one is what we call as firmness which is about structural engineering and second is about utilitas or commodity it's about good planning and third is delight which is aesthetics which most of us like it quite a lot but how do we plan for buildings how do we do it so the main thing is that engineers learn by precedents they learn by similar project in history they learn from failures they learn from similar sites and they learn from similar sizes another good proverb is the genius is one person inspiration and 99 person perspiration thomas edison we all have to put our work in a good planning these are two resources metric handbook planning and design for architecture and eurofort architectures guide how big is big how much do i need it's about space planning so do we need two car spaces or one car spaces in a house and what would be typical size of these car spaces so these all things are needed in architectural design but i'm not going to focus too much on architectural side it's just to be mindful of the needs of various stakeholders then i will move on to structural design and then natural light natural light is extremely useful it has beneficial effect on human beings and it makes us productive and it fulfills our requirements of vitamin d as well we take care of that as well and then again different buildings different layouts about natural lighting it has to be balanced i mean you have to strike a balance between light and thermal comfort you cannot put windows all the way around and then it compromises the thermal comfort of people living inside but in some of the countries obviously it will not be thermal comfort it will be kind of cooling effect and then building services how are you going to pass building services in the building these are very easy to pass through steel members and you can see that these are cast related members where these steel services pass through easily new slim deck floors they make our life easier in terms of passing these services now we focus our attention to basics of structural design which is our key topic today and i will cover two things concept design and scheme design 
and what does it mean by concept design what do we need in concept design what is expected this is something which can be done in any design code to be honest it is independent of design codes these are initial calculations and i believe you can pretty much design anything using these rules of thumb and then come up with a perfect design and the rest is simply details the first thing about concept design is coming up with the grid so what would be the size of the grid so you have to start thinking about column positions now here you can see that we have atrium in the middle and then we have columns all the way surrounding the building the core positions where will be your lift course respecting requirements of other users like parking and other things the parking typically has a specific spacings office tenants may have requirement for minimum column spacings because of different requirements residential buildings they have requirements about apartment divisions so if you have a multi story building the columns have to align with the apartment divisions so you have to think about it special uses cinemas halls and shoppings may have different requirements now the grid mismatches will require transfer structures this is very important in concrete buildings we use large beams or slabs and in case of steel buildings we use girders or trusses now here building on your right you can see that the floors here don't have any beams across so that's the reason that you will require large beams so you need larger beams up and down to be able to carry these loading on your left you can see that we have column above this girder and then you can see that they go all the way through the top which are quite a lot of stories 12 15 stories and then to carry this load of column we need this truss so if there is a mismatch of grid then it will always require some kind of transfer structure then again you can see that for this structure it's got pile of foundations you can see that here you have a mismatch of grid and then you can see this bracing in the building these are some kind of cables which are attached here and then load paths how loads are transferred typically we have two types of loads we have gravity loads and we have lateral loads so buildings are constructed from bottom to top but loads are transferred from top to bottom the main loads that we consider in buildings are gravity loads and lateral loads so gravity loads they are transferred from slabs to beams and then from beams to columns and then from columns to foundations and then from foundation to ground so this is how gravity loads are transferred and then we have lateral loads the load paths are extremely important so that we understand that how load is transferred lateral loads are usually horizontal loads wind and earthquake loads so the load is taken on the facade of a building and the load is transferred via diaphragm diaphragm means that it's transferred through kind of slab or something and then floor bracing if there is any kind of bracing in the floor and then it is taken to the lateral loading system lateral loading system could be your bracing it could be moment frame or it could be your reinforced concrete core so it could be any of these bracing moment connections and core or shear wall in simple terms they resist the lateral loading so this is how load path works for lateral loads then finally from there it is taken to the ground now load combination we have to talk about all load combinations so loads can act in combination so gravity loads can act in combination with wind loading so we have to consider all possible load combinations now floor framing it is very important to understand what do we mean by framing and how this load is transferred the load is transferred from slab to secondary beams and from secondary beams it is transferred to primary beams this is the spanning direction of the slab so it means that load is transferred to this secondary beam and from this secondary beam the load is transferred to primary beams and from primary beams load is transferred to the column and from column the load is transferred to the foundations so as primary beams carry heavy loads that's the reason they are shorter than the secondary beam and most common floor systems in the uk are composite slab with profile sheetings and then we have this precast hollow core units as well 
So there are three possibilities in the UK for composite slabs. One is composite slab with profile sheeting, which is on your left. And another possibility is precast flow slab, which is on your right. And third possibility is reinforced concrete slab. But normally we do not use reinforced concrete slab in the UK. Profile sheeting slabs are very common. We call them as composite slabs. Precast hollow core units are very common. In profile sheeting slabs, we use primary secondary beam configuration. And in precast units, we use main beam and tie beam configuration. And then uh, here you can see two types of grids. For example, the dimensions here are six and nine. This is six and nine. If you span your secondary beams, these are secondary beams. These are your, your primary beams. If you span your your secondary beams on shorter side then primary beam will have lots of larger dimensions and it will lead to less economy in this configuration there is another key difference although both designs are fine structurally they are okay that in scheme a you have 15 primary beams in scheme number two you have 12 primary beams you have less primary beams in scheme two than in this scheme on your left. So when you have less primary beams, then obviously the design is going to be effective. So it is about the primary beams. You, you can see that we have less primary beams in scheme B. So this is going to be economical. So this is better. Although I'm in a scheme A, it provides equally good solution. But in terms of economy, scheme B is going to be better.